Hello, hello everyone, it's Martin AK Anders, and it has been eons since I've been able to put out any content. I'm sorry about that for those of you who have been really close followers of this channel, but between working with Virtuoso, getting the collegiate program that I operate up and running for this fall, and some other side projects that I can't exactly share just yet, I've been absolutely flat out, but at the same time, so has the metagame. Since patch 3.01 and the eventual addition of Ko after his grace period, things have gotten wild to say the very least, and we finally get to take a look at that. Let's jump right into it. One last add-in, and that's that many of you ask where this data is coming from. This is global data from tier two scenes and upward. I'm using a definition for that of minimum prize pools of $1,000, and or at least three teams competing in the event that are within the top 20 of that region's respective scene. Given those parameters, this is an over 40,000 round sample from the last two months. With that out of the way, let's really jump into it. In the interest of getting the most valuable info out as quickly as possible, I've synthesized all of this down to this primary grid. You have rows for every agent, a column for pick rate, and then columns for the round win rate in non-mirror matchups across all maps and then on a map by map basis. In all of the instances where you see a not applicable under a map specific win rate, that's because for that agent on that map, we lacked a minimum 100 map sample size, giving us no confidence in those numbers and I opted to completely leave them out. It's important to remember also when looking at that dynamic that there's two edges to the sword. It can mean that either the agent wasn't played enough on that map to get a reasonable sample, or it could be that the agent is played so much that it's nothing but mirror matchups. But that's enough stage setting, let's get into this. In the interest of not just reading off a list of numbers to you, I'm going to keep this down to just the ones that I think are particularly worthy of note, and you can read through them on your own if you want a more comprehensive idea of how things look, and that will start us out with Sova and Jet here at the top of the pick rate order. At 75.7 and 73 flat respectively, they're head and shoulders above the rest of the pack so much so that there is a more than 30 point drop off to get to that third slot. And as you expand downward past that third slot, include the fourth and the fifth, you actually end up with one of the most prevalent compositions on Icebox. We'll touch on this more later when we get to Icebox compositions, but when we look at how concentrated the metagame is on that map, where really you're only looking at one of two setups, it makes a lot of sense that these agents have been driven up as high as they have. The last thing I wanted to highlight with pick rates was the highest discrepancies between pick rate and non-mirror win, and that will bring us to Sky, Rays, and Astra. Sky coming in at just shy of 36% has an over 51% non-mirror win rate. Rays is even worse still with a 31% pick rate and a 51.3% non-mirror win rate, and Astra tops that pack with a 28.8% pick rate and that same as Rays 51.3% non-mirror win. These are the agents that are throwing us soft signals of play me more. Going straight into the mix of the maps though, we start with Ascent. Right from the get-go, there's an interesting dichotomy between duelists that I wanted to highlight. Jet, despite being a staple pick on this map, is chronically underperforming and has been for a really long time if I'm being honest. I'm probably the most outspoken opponent of Jet's, and while I say opponent, I'm just less high on her than a lot of other analysts I've spoken to. I think she's a little bit overrated in terms of the value she can consistently bring to a team compared to counterparts, and this specific instance puts that on grand display. We have Jet coming in at a 48.4% non-mirror win, where Raze comes in at an astronomical 53%. These are both agents that fill that primary dive role, they can play verticality with the op, obviously you have better safeties built into Jet, but Raze just offers more broad utility in rounds where that pop-off doesn't come to fruition. The next pairing I thought worth highlighting was the dramatic comparison between Sentinels on this map. We have Killjoy coming in at 50.7%, whereas Cypher is struggling considerably at only 47.2. 
If we cheat into the future a little bit and look across horizontally, we can tell that this is a fairly consistent trend in that Killjoy is just the better Sentinel right now, at least as far as numbers are concerned. Next up to bat is something that has been a fairly hot topic of conversation as of recent, where we're moving towards Berlin and Masters 3, a lot of people are hearkening back to performances at Masters 2, and specifically the role that Astra played in certain team successes and failures. A lot of region's struggles were blamed on the fact that they hadn't sufficiently adapted to the Astra and more specifically Astra Viper metas, and this seems like there's sort of a continuation of that going on. We see that there are teams that have significantly moved back over to Omen on Ascent, enough so that there was a valid sample size for this, so well over 100 maps, and yet it only posted a 48.8% non-mirror win rate compared to Astra on the map, which is creeping up on 52%. Second to last thing that I wanted to highlight for Ascent were what I'll call the winners of this map, both Sage and Sky, who don't necessarily have a direct counterpart, but are vastly overperforming the general aggregate of agents here. And lastly, we have the losers, which will actually probably surprise a lot of people, especially North American players who will remember the Jet Phoenix days of Ascent, where Reyna and Phoenix, the Flash duelists, are both extraordinarily underperforming on this map right now. Reyna barely squeaks by at a 49.5% and Phoenix is not even close at 46 flat. To put things in perspective, that is the single lowest non-mirror win rate that had a sufficient sample of anything on this chart. Shifting over to Bind, there's really only two things I wanted to highlight here, and I think it's because they flag a more broad metagame shift on the map, and that's that Viper and Rays are both north of 52% non-bear win rate, 52.5% for Viper, and a full 53.5% for Rays. I think we've all seen and understood the evolution at this point, where we went from a more standard style bind over to this more mid-rangey setup that was spearheaded by teams like Fnatic, and this just further cements that that style very much so feels at home on this map. On Breeze, it's a little bit tricky because there's obviously not as much of a sample here as there is for many of the other maps. The main thing that I wanted to highlight were just the agents that are succeeding on it right now. We have Sova at 51%, Sage at nearly 53%, Killjoy at 51.4 and Sky at 50.8. I think the headline agent for me here, despite the fact that it's not the most dramatic, is the Killjoy. There were a lot of early questions as to whether or not Sentinels were going to be high return on investment on this map, and when the rubber hit the pavement, it's looking like Killjoy is a very sensible inclusion in your compositions. Panning over to Haven, we get a little bit of deja vu, that same jet Rays relationship where Jet is struggling at only 48.6% non-mirror, and Rays is at a much healthier 50.5. A repeat of the Sentinel dynamic as well, with Killjoy creeping up on 52% non-mirror win, meanwhile Cypher struggling to approach even 50. Yet another repeat, but this time with controllers, we see Astra coming in at almost 52% non-mirror win, while Omen struggles at 49. And now that we've got reinforcing those three things out of the way, there is one element here that is map specific that I wanted to highlight, and that's the particular success of Flash Initiators on the map. We have Sky coming in at 50.9%, and Breach coming in at a pretty crazy 52.9% when you look at the win rates across the rest of the agents here. This is going to be spearheaded by the success that we see in Korea and Southeast Asia, where Breach on Haven has kind of been their bread and butter for an extremely long time, and the teams who have mastered it roll over their competition. Now we get to Icebox, and there's really no way of framing this that doesn't just give away everything we're going to talk about when we look at compositions. There's only two agents on this map that have a significant sample when it comes to non-mirror win rates, and that's Killjoys, and Reynas, and it's because there are two primary compositions we see here. We see the European style Killjoy included setup, and we see the Sentinels style Reyna included setup. There's a clear winner in this dynamic thus far, but Iceland had different things to say, so we'll have to see how it pans out in the longer run. 
that will bring us to split to round it out and the first thing shockingly is actually the first reversal of that jet raise dynamic we've touched on a few times we see jet coming in at 51 percent non-mirror win whereas raise is coming in at only 49.3 and it's on a map where almost everyone you would talk to intuitively would expect that raise be better on the map because she's been such a mainstay here since the earliest stages of the map's play but I think it's also for that reason that Jet being better here maybe shouldn't be such a shock. When you start digging below the surface, Jet has more of a playground here than she has on almost any other map in the pool. There's tons of value that both agents can get in terms of verticality, but in my personal opinion, this is the most underappreciated map when it comes to the value you can get out of cloud bursts. There are so many vision corridors here that you can get disproportionate value out of that it's insane. You want to cross a main in towards ramp, it's a perfect use for a cloudburst. You want to cross from bottom mid past mail room into vents, perfect place for a cloudburst. The short duration smoke feels more useful and more natural on this map than basically anywhere else and I don't think people have fully caught on to that. Next up, we don't have quite another reversal, but we have the thinnest margin between Killjoy and Cypher of any map in the pool. Killjoy coming in at a dead 50-50 and Cypher creeping as near to a 50% as he gets with a 49.7. And now we get a little bit into the spice, the winners of the map. And the first one I want to look at is Viper. We haven't seen a ton of her since the earlier days where Xset brought her out and really made a splash in the North American ecosystem, but she's still putting up numbers that indicate she should be looked at a lot harder by more teams than are currently leveraging her. And then the huge winners are Sky and Astra, both breaking through that 52.5% non-mirror win rate barrier. They absolutely farm on this map. That will wrap us up for the agent pick and win rates though, and Without further ado, let's just hop right into compositions. Starting out with Ascent, all of these are just going to be a quick hit top 5 most played compositions for each given map. Here we immediately see some blatant common threads. You've got Jet, Killjoy, Sova across all 5 compositions and that first column only forking one of two directions with either an Astro or an Omen as your controller. It's only that final 5th slot that sees a noteworthy amount of variation, predominantly Flash using agents. We have Sky, KO, Phoenix across the majority of them. We do see, however, a lone Sky. All of these compositions, though, are boasting pretty impressive win rates. There's a reason that they're in the top five, and that won't necessarily be the case when we start looking over to other maps. Kicking over to Bind, we see that Fnatic's influences are still very much so alive and well. The top two compositions being that Brimstone Rays Sky Viper core that they more or less brought onto the scene in its entirety. One variation with a Sage, one variation with a Sova here as the two top most played compositions on the map. And in a twist that I'm sure is gonna surprise a lot of people, the version with Sage actually vastly outperforms the variation with Double Initiator. One more notch down the list, we see an Astra variation of that top composition. And then rounding out the four and five slots, we see two Double Duelist setups, classic raised Jet Double Dive, but in an unsupported fashion, there's no particular flashes behind them. In one setup, it'll be backed up by an Astra Sova Cypher, and in the fifth most played, it will be an Omen Sova Killjoy. One thing to note here is just how dramatically the pick rates drop off. We have an 8.3% pick rate, a 7.9% pick rate, and then an absolute fall off to a 2.4 and then 1.6s. The variation in overall compositions that we see on bind is greater than on any other map. We're talking a total of 172 different compositions played over the last two months. Shifting over to the new map in Breeze, you'd almost expect it to have a lot of compositional variety, but it's the exact opposite. The top slot takes a full 30% of the metagame. Here we see again some significant common threads, Viper, Jet, and Sky being absolute mainstays. We see Sova making pretty frequent occurrences, as well as Sentinels picking up a lot of ground. But the key thing I wanted to highlight here was that four of these comps have over 50% win rates and one falls significantly behind the rest. On Breeze, you generally want to be running comps that function under a pretty universal premise, and that's that you want info and you want stall and entrenchment. 
The three main pieces of the puzzle, the Viper, Jet, and Sky, provide those fairly well. You've got Entrenchment and Stall in the Viper, you've got Soft Information in the Sky, but you don't really have enough to really flesh out the entire composition, so it's on you to fill out those last two slots and really lean into things the way that's required. The true Sentinels in Killjoy and Cypher obviously do that phenomenally well, bringing both stall and information. Sova is obviously a fantastic information agent, and Sage will be one of the best stall and entrenchment agents in the game. And so if we go down the list, we can see Top composition checks both boxes extremely well, leaning slightly more heavily into info than entrenchment. Same with the second comp. The fourth comp shifts to the other side of that coin, focuses a little bit more on stall and entrenchment than it does on info, but still does both things extremely well. The fifth slot does a little bit of the same, but instead of bringing in a sort of true info character, it's relying more on Reyna's ability to aggress and having that double duelist to prod out and get info proactively than it is on that more stally style. And it's when we go back up to that third composition that they really completely miss the mark. You've got double duelists, so you're in a great position to prod for that information as I just said, but then what's also around it? Double initiator, which its primary use case is going for more information, and then a lone viper as your only form of stall. This composition is going to have complete knowledge of what's going on in the map, but it relies so much on effectively skirmishing to hold sites that its win rate suffers because of it. We're looking at a comp where its largest asset is its ability to gather tons and tons of information, but then you're playing it on a map that has some of the longest rotations in the game. It doesn't matter how well you're gathering this info. If the site acres can't stall or you're not prepared to have the most mind-boggling retakes you can possibly imagine, it's just not going to make it. Heading over to Haven, we have an interesting mix, another three-piece core, Jet, Cypher, Sova in this case, with a fourth slot allocated to controllers, be it Omen or Astra. And it's that fifth slot that again is dominated by flash wielding characters, phoenixes, KOs, and skies. And you may look at these and be like, hey, Anders, none of these are particularly good, and you would be dead on. Being played a lot doesn't make it good, and in Haven's case in particular, the most successful compositions are generally runs that are going to be running Sages, or sort of this bottom composition on the list, the Astra with double initiator, but swapping in a Killjoy instead of the Cypher in order to find greater value. And that will bring us to Icebox, which I'm sorry to troll, but I didn't even include anything beyond the top two compositions, because frankly they're the only ones that matter right now. The map plays extremely linearly, and because of that, you see two top dogs with 41.4 and 34.2% meta share each. This is basically a two horse race. And as we saw with the agent picks, at least in terms of the aggregated numbers, there is a head and shoulders dominant winner here. On a map that plays very formulaically, having a sentinel to both flank and or deny flanks consistently has outsized value. Who would have thought? Closing us out yet again, we have Split, and we see a little bit more of a jumble than we have on really any of the other maps so far. Sage being the only truly consistent piece, we see that both the controllers and sentinels are splitting duty, with Omen and Astra sharing the prior, and Killjoy and Cypher sharing the latter. And those last two slots, as they tend to be, are pretty mixed up. In the top slot, we have Double Dive, and then in the ensuing four slots, we have different variations of supported single dive. So a Breach with a Raise, a Sky with a Raise, or a Sky with a Jet. With all the numbers out of the way and an established understanding of where we think the metagame is headed prior to Berlin, it just wouldn't be one of my videos if there wasn't some abstract theory take at the end, so here we go. For those of you who have watched my Mastering Macro series, this triangle will be very familiar. It's a style dynamics triangle that comes from TCGs, comes from tabletop board games. It is one of the most common dynamics that we have seen across gaming for decades. It's also one that's been able to be applied to Valorant increasingly over the past couple of months. So much so that there are even flagship compositions that I would assign as typifying each of these in the current metagame. Under Aggro's vertical, we'd have the classic North American Double Duelist setup with Jet and Phoenix. Under Control, we'd have the Astro Viper Killjoy setups that tormented the run-up to Iceland. 
And under mid-range, we'd have the increasingly prevalent double initiator Viper setups. If we go back to the earliest stages of VCT, aggro was king. Double Duelist was incredibly dominant. North America was leading the pack in terms of metagame development. They were at the pinnacle. Seemingly in answer to this, we saw balance adjustments that first of all, introduce Astra to the game in general, but also massively buffed Viper. This had the end effect of bolstering heavily the thing that aggro was supposed to be able to readily beat, as well as making midrange the thing that's supposed to beat aggro slightly better as well. And that ultimately led to a metagame where those Astra Viper Killjoy control compositions were borderline oppressive in the run-up to Masters 2. So much so that they ended up getting nerfed. Astra saw nerfs, Killjoy saw nerfs, and Viper saw soft nerfs, while at the same time we saw soft buffs to Sky. If you see right here on this chart, you can tell the cyclicality that's being induced in this metagame. Aggro was overpowered, they bolstered the other two sides of the triangle. Then Control got too far out of hand, so now they're bringing up midrange. The net effect of this is that we're at a point in the cyclicality where KO's been added to the mid-range toolkit, the compositions themselves are naturally very powerful right now, Control is still reeling a little bit from its recent nerfs, and Aggro has been left out to dry to the point where we see almost no high success double duelist compositions anymore. That leaves our expectations for Berlin that, in terms of this stylistic trio, Aggro is going to be the least played, coming in a distant third to its counterparts mid-range to be leading the pack, and control to be rounding it out as the second most powerful. The clear caveat and mix-up to this being that when we look at the flow of this triangle, control is still the natural counter to mid-range, and depending on the circles you speak to, many still believe that the nerfs weren't enough to knock it down completely. If there are going to be major upsets in the back end of these Stage 3 qualifiers, as well as Berlin itself, I expect it to be off of the back of these highly structured, formulaic control compositions, shutting down more skirmishy, mid-rangey setups. Now, if you have no idea what the hell I was just talking about, I highly recommend that you go back and watch my Mastering Macro series. It's sort of the foundational elements of the way that I think about the game, and it frames a lot of the discussion that I have about it. And so if you go back, I promise you can come back to this, know exactly what I'm talking about, and it will give you a cool framework to look at future events with. For those of you who do get it, as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, I apologize for being gone for so long. I'm just spread really thin right now, I try to get whatever I can, and hopefully this gives you enough excitement to frame your Berlin viewing experience as we go into all of these regional finals. Per the usual, if you're enjoying my content, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and as always, Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you in the next one.